Welcome to Web Chat with Minnesota Adult Education. It's in the middle of the summer. Uh, happy Wednesday, July 12th. It's good to see you all virtually here um, today. Let's uh, admit, as we go on to our next slide, the agenda, you'll see we have quite a bit uh, that we have to share with you today. And so that's why we've extended the summer web chat um, for, uh, from one to three o'clock so that we can make sure we get through um, all of this information with you and still have time for your questions. So uh, let's jump right in and start with some introductions. My name is Brad Haskamp, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm the State Director of Adult Education. I'd like to note that Astrid Leiden is, uh, uh, her pronouns are she, her, our professional development specialist is on vacation, lucky her today. So uh, I, uh, we're very glad that she gets to enjoy some time away. Jody. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Jody Versa, my pronouns are she, her, and I am the program quality specialist on the team. And I'll hand it off to Julie. Good afternoon, everyone, and a happy summer to you. I'm the Transition Specialist at the Department of Education, and I'll hand it off to Brandy. Hi, everyone. I'm Brandy Logan. I go by she, her, and I am the HSC and Accountability Specialist for the Department of Ed, Adult Ed, and I will hand it off to Neil. My apologies, Neil might be a little bit busy, so I'm going to bring it back to Brad. No, sorry, it's just screen sharing. Zoom was hiding everything from me. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Neil Allard. My pronouns are they, them. I'm the records communications and admin support specialist. Thank you so much, Neil. Thank you, team. Uh, and thank you, Wendy, for being our, te our tech host and technical assistance for today. I do want to give you some exciting news that we do have a new staff person joining us a week from today. Haley Swanson, um, who has been working with uh, Metro East and SCRED, or the St. Croix River Education District, is joining our team here at the Minnesota Department of Education. Haley, she is jumping into the role of grants, records, and administrative support here on our team. Um, so we'll be working very closely with Neil with the records and we'll actually be helping a lot with a lot of our team grant work and some of our other administrative support and leadership. So we're really excited to welcome uh, Haley to the team next week and we'll uh, send an email to let you know a little bit more about Haley later on. It'll be exciting. This will finally be a full complete hired team, um, at least according to our budget, for the first time in more than three years so, or in about three years. So that's exciting. Yes. And just a note today, because we are doing a longer session, we will also be taking a five minute break about halfway through. So don't worry, we're not gonna have to sit here for the full two hours. We'll make sure to give you a short break in the middle. We do have a couple of announcements that we wanna share with you before as we dive in. Um, so we are excited to announce that we have our first new consortium application in years, maybe even decades. Um, I know it's the first app new application we've seen since we uh, any of us that are currently on the team have been here. Um, so in the, in the last uh, uh, 15 to 20 years, there has not been a new application. So this is exciting. Uh, so the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe is joining us as a new consortium. We have granted them provisional approval and uh, and so there will be some additional steps that they'll need to take as a new consortium. You can imagine that there is a lot to, that, to learn as you jump into the system. They had worked as a, um, as a program within or as a site within Central Minnesota Adult Education, and they've been doing some collaboration or talks with AEOA as well. And they are now going to be their own consortium. So there'll be some follow-up with them through the next year as we get them, as we get them onboarded. But we're excited to welcome the Lax Band of Ojibwe to our adult education field and family. And then I'm going to turn it over to C. Mualeski from Southwest ABE to tell us a little bit more and promote uh, uh, two exciting opportunities that are coming in. C, are you here? Oh, it looks like C is just joining us. But uh, C. Mualeski and Southwest ABE are joining the Racial Equity um, uh, 
or they are overseeing the racial equity and adult education grant. And they have two advisory groups that they are promoting and they would like us and they would like a little bit of information to uh, they'd like to share a little bit of information about some of these advisory groups that they have um, openings for. See, are you with us? See, yeah. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the opportunities? I am sorry for being late. I was trying to finish up another meeting. Um, okay, yeah. So we are. Um, this is our last year of the racial equity grant, and so we are looking for our last advisory groups. We have our REAP group, which is our racial equity AB and partners. And so this is anybody that's ABE, anybody that works with AB, such as community education, any of our um, sponsors, things like that, if they want to work with it. Thank you for putting that um, in the chat there, Neil. But the um, application, Neil just put in there. Um, if you are interested, we are looking for applicants. And with this last year, what we're mainly going to be doing is um, looking at the um, results and making recommendations to the state of what we can do, and also making some recommendations for PD or just anything that we can do to um, make ABE more equitable. So we're really excited about this last year. We'll be connecting our focus group this last year as well too. So um, there is another one that we're also looking as well. Yep, this, which is the real advisor group. Um, and this is for any of your students who are either current or past students um, that are interested in signing up and being in this advisor group. And just make sure that when you um, share it with your students, make sure you let them know that this is not a class and this is an advisory group because we've had um, some confusion in the past where people thought it was a class and they were getting paid to be in a class. So just make sure that you clarify that with them. But we're um, really excited we've had great groups the last two years. So we hope that um, if you are already in it, sign up again. And if you are new or interested and wanna take part in um, making change in the ABE uh, field, we'd love to have you. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, C. And I hope many of you consider uh, uh, participating or recommending people to participate in those advisory groups. Thank you. Um, let's dive in to something not nearly as exciting, but uh, something that uh, is on some of your minds. Uh, let's talk about the August reporting submission that is due August 1st, uh, 2023. So first, uh, so that is due on Tuesday, the 1st of August, um, by the end of the day. Each consortium is required to send this the completed August reporting submission documents, a level gains report for your consortium, and if you're working with employers or serving employers, the effectiveness and serving employer spreadsheets. Um, this year, we're having you email that, those documents, those, the, the August reporting submission to Neil Allard at their individual email address listed on the screen here. And if you uh, don't remember this uh, uh, information, we did send this information out, or Neil sent this information out on June 7th to each of your, to, to, the, uh, to our email list. So check uh, for an email from Neil on June 7th if you have not yet seen this. And in this August reporting submission, there are seven sections this year. Uh, so, uh, and we'll dive in and walk through, guide you through each of those pieces. I know we have some new folks in our system. So we wanna make sure we gave you clear directions on each of those seven sections. Um, and so let's go into the next slide here. And that first component is that level gains with post-test report for all ABE participants. So make sure that you have all of the required data entered through June 30th, 2023, like your enrollee registration information, your test scores, contact hours, proxy hours, and diplomas earned. And uh, then you'll download from SID that level gains with post-test report and make sure you use the dates July 1, 2022 to June 30th of 2023. And then you'll attach that report as a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet um, with your August reporting submission. And this report needs to include uh, participants and outcomes for your entire ABE consortium. Let's go on to the next slide. And then the second component of this reporting uh, due August 1st is the annual volunteer information report. And so uh, there is, uh, you'll, you, can, you have a couple of options. You can either ha just have your consortium complete this once as an entire consortium, 
Or if you have a larger consortium with several providers, each working with volunteers, you can have you can assign this to vary to the providers within your consortium. Um, and there are two versions of this re, of this um, survey. So you'll fill out one or the other. Either you did not use volunteer or you did use volunteers. And so you'll fill out the appropriate survey, whether or not you use volunteers in the, during this past year, from July of 2022 to June of 2023. If you, um, luckily there is some help in um, SID where you can actually run the annual volunteer report and that will help you with some, with your statistics of all the volunteer information you've entered in SID. And that can help you with a lot of the questions. Um, and also just note, that if a learner or a volunteer fits multiple categories, because it'll ask you to uh, classify folks in various categories, you can li just list them once. Do not list them in each category. Just list them in the, either their primary category or whichever category fits them best. Um, and also with this report, you can go into that survey, that um, annual volunteer uh, information report. And if you have to step away or need to, uh, you can make, you can save it and then make your changes or finish it up later. So you have that option within this um, report as well. So no worries about that online report. We did, um, the uh, Literacy Minnesota, our SID staff have developed some um, excellent additional resources for you in completing this. There, there's a webinar that was done, that was uh, done in early June that you can listen to if you have any questions um, or want to dive deeper or learn more about the annual volunteer information report. Also, there is a SID Help Center article um, that you can refer to. And Neil has put those um, links in the chat so you can take a look. Um, they included the links for those two help resources as well as the, the preview questions and the, and, and the reports themselves. So you can take a look at those. Note that, all, um, that uh, many of these links are also in the August report submission document. Let's go on to the next slide. And then if we move on, as we move on to component three, um, the component three is the effectiveness in serving employers um, uh, from June, uh, July of 2022 to June of 2023. We are still using the same format that we used last year. Um, and so that includes an Excel spreadsheet. So you'll complete that spreadsheet that was attached with the email that Neil sent out with the August reporting submission. Um, and uh, you can, Document all employers that your consortium has served from July to June, um, July of 2022 to June of 2023. And we also need the information on what type of service was provided. Julie will dive into this a little bit more on the next slide. And just know if, you're, if your consortium is not serving any employers, you do not need to complete the spreadsheet. And you'll see in the chat that Neil has um, uploaded the spreadsheet. Thank you so much, Neil. Let's go to the next slide. I'm going to turn it over to Julie to talk a little bit about this spreadsheet and the services. Julie. Thank you, Brad. Um, they, this is a process that uh, the Department of Employment and Economic Development has worked on, um, and it may change in the upcoming year. But for last year's reporting, they have several categories that they like to break down um, the service to employers in. The one category that actually I think most ABE programs would fall into is the accessing untapped labor pools. Um, and there they, they list uh, limited English proficient and others. I think that's uh, not necessarily true that they're untapped labor pools, but this is an area where most ABE programs do serve employers. If you think, oh, we really don't do much with employers um, and I'm not going to bother with that, I would encourage you just to look at some of the different activities that uh, we consider assisting employers assisting or serving employers um, on this sheet. Um, uh, I know some people will put in job fairs, some people will put in speakers, classroom speakers. So just make sure if you are serving the employer in any way, shape or form, that you count it as a service to that employer. And then on the next slide, is a screenshot of the Excel document that is in the August submission. It's just pretty straightforward. 
If you do not know the federal employer ID number or the state employer ID number, um, don't worry about it. That's something um, I believe Deed can look up, but they would like the, the physical address and uh, details of what types of services were provided. Um, and so with that, we'll move on to the next slide. Well, actually, think... before we go to the next slide, Julie, we do have a question about this. Neil, if you could jump to the, er, the previous slide. And Julie, help me think through this. Uh, so okay. Caroline asked, if someone is doing an on-site class at an employer location at a work at a work site, would that be um, service type three or four or something else? Um, I would put it under five, actually. Under five. Yeah, yep, it is a, it's a training. You. It's a training service um, that is provided through state and federal funding. If, if you're, yep, if you're on, if you are providing services on site. Excellent. Excellent. And I'm assuming that's with employees on site. Yep, that would make sense that this would be a training service. Um, yeah, excellent. Thanks, yeah. Julie. Mm -hmm. okay. So that is that uh, component three, the effectiveness in serving employers. Component four is an estimate of IET workforce training costs. And again, we're using that same time period of July 2022 to June of 2023. So this applies, you need to meet mo both criteria in order to report anything but zero. You need to first have operated an approved IET program during that time period. And you need to have paid for that the students workforce training portion of the IET using state or federal ADE funding or federal IEC, IELCE funding um, or integrated English literacy and civics education grant funding. So you have to um, be operating an approved IET program and you need to have paid for the training component for the students of that IET using those state or federal adult education or the federal IELCE funds. And, um, and if you have any questions about that, you can always reach out to us to talk a little bit about that. But really, um, that it's specifically for that workforce training component, which we've defined here. And the costs can include staffing, materials, any testing fees, or other resources that you paid for, um, or that your consortium paid for using that state or federal funding for the workforce training component. Jill, I see you in the comments asked, what about regional transitions funds? Yes, include that as well. Regional transitions funds are federal adult education funds. So yes, you would, you would mark those as well and include those as federal adult education funds. Um, and then Kathleen, you're asking, approve for IET before it was offered or after retroactively? If you got retroactive approval, you can still count that. So yes, if you got retroactive approval, please still include those workforce training costs in this document or in this section or component four. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So a little bit of what you're going to be answering, you have to just give a yes or no for three questions. Like first, did you offer any IET programming that was, uh, that was approved? Did the consortium pay for the workforce training component for those students? And did you use state AB funding and or federal AB funding or federal ILCE funding? And if you answer no to any of those three questions, your what you report to us will be zero in all categories. If you say you have to say yes to all three, and if you say yes to all three, then you would report something other than zero. And on the next slide here, you can see where you would document that. There you can document your state AB grant funding, federal adult education grant funding, IELCE grant funding. And I know some folks in the past have put other funding with some sort of in-kind or other type of funding. You can feel free to um, enter that and provide some details um, in, that, in that last row if that applies to you and if that's something you'd like to share. All right. Then that, um, I see a question here in the chat. Um, 
if the classes were, went, were through regional funds, how do you count them for a consortium? Basically, whoever re used the regional funds and paid for it using the regional funds, that consortium would report that. So not every consortium in the region would count it, but whichever consortium used the funds to pay for the training would document that in their consortium's uh, August reporting submission. Then um, I see Amy is asking, what about having our students participate in a statewide online course that was IET, but we were not the provider? In that case, you did not pay for any training from your consortium, so you would report zero. Um, the entity that would be providing that statewide online training course, they would report the training that they paid for using state or federal funds. But if you just referred students to those statewide courses, you report zero because your consortium paid zero dollars for the official training of an approved IET. And then, uh, and then Penny is asking if it was a regional transitions class, we have three consortiums involved. Does every consortium count them? No, whichever consortium paid for the training, whichever consortium paid for the training would document that expense. So if all three consortia say paid a small part of that training cost of that approved IET, then every consortium would just report what they, their individual consortium paid. Um, so because one of the consortia paid for that, paid for the training if you use regional transitions funding, but not necessarily all three. So which, whatever your consortium paid, no matter which source of funding it is, federal adult education, whether that be through your direct grant or through the regional transitions or some or the state AD funding, you would count that you would count whatever you or document whatever you paid for from your consortium directly to the training. And yes, Eric, uh, regional transitions funds are federal funds. Okay. I think we got all the questions on that one. I appreciate the questions because that show, like, I, 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 it's helpful for us to know what questions you have, and also it's just it's it's it, it's telling me that the, that there are questions and that, that that are being raised here. So I so I appreciate that, and it shows that's helpful that we're going through this. So thanks each and every one of you for the questions that you're raising. Going on to section five, I would do want to take a little bit of extra time on this one because this is a new section for you this year. We are required to estimate the amount of career services and the cost or that the cost of those career services that are provided using state or federal ABE funding or federal IELCE funding. Now, this is a new this is a new thing that we are asking you this year. It is a requirement from the federal government that we ask you now. Um, so career services as they are defined by the federal government include outreach, intake, and orientation information. What are the costs of providing that information? Pre-testing skill levels, that includes your NRS testing for anyone. Also, if you're doing any pre-testing um, or assessment of aptitudes, abilities, or support services needs, um, you would also document any costs of providing those tests. You would then also provide the costs of providing any referrals, to other programs and services for students or coordinating with other programs and services with act on activities. Any amount of uh, time that you're spending with that referrals or the coordination of those activities, you would estimate and document those costs. And you'll be uh, documenting any costs for sharing performance information and program cost information on eligible providers of education, training, and workforce services. Um, that can be by program or provider type. And any costs that you incur um, using those state or federal ABE or ILCE funds on sharing information on support services or assistance uh, programs or referrals to these, such as childcare, child support, Medicaid, CHIP, SNAP, EITC, um, Earned Income Tax Credit, TANF, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, and that would include MFIP, Minnesota Family Investment Program, and any other supportive services that can fill that, that um, the acronym pool. Um, and that also includes transportation costs, um, sharing information on those, uh, on those supportive services. So um, this is, again, we're asking you to, the, and the feds are asking you to provide an estimate. Now, should you spend hours and hours and hours 
trying to develop that estimate? No, we're asking for your best faith effort in providing an estimate per consortium on providing those five services. Um, and just a little bit more about this. Thanks, Neil. In the past, so we have been reporting on this for years. The state in the past, we, uh, um, our office used to estimate that as, um, those career service costs. We would do that ourselves. And, um, now though, the US Department of Education is saying that states are no longer able to provide a statewide estimate, that now grantees and providers are required to provide the estimates. Um, we, cannot, we can no longer provide that estimate. Just a little bit of info on how we used to estimate that with our best faith effort is we used to calculate career services and think about what those services looked like. And we estimated that each participant received an estimated six hours of career services per year. That was just our guess. And then we used the contact hour rate to estimate how much the state paid or how much those grant that, that cost if there were six contact hours in those career services, what did that cost in, the, in that state pool of state funding? How much did that cost according to our federal money? And that's how we would compile that, that um, estimate at the state level. That's just some helpful information. You can utilize something similar to that if that makes the most sense for you, or if you have some other ways to estimate that, go ahead. Um, whatever makes the most sense to create a reasonable, uh, reasonably accurate and whatever way to get an attainable estimate we, like, we, we encourage and support you in doing whatever seems reasonable from your perspective. I see we have some questions, so I'm going to take some time to uh, um, look through your questions and make sure I, I address them. So just one second here. Um, so Caroline, I see that you're saying about those first two bullet points. Is this um, on, the, on outreach intake and orientation information, as well as pre-testing students? Um, on their skill levels or to doing aptitude tests or ability tests on abilities or tests for eligibility for supportive services. Um, is this only in relation to how we refer to workforce? No, that is not limited to how like any referrals to workforce. This is for any of your students, any of your students that you're providing this information to, technically that counts according to this career service cost. Um, at least according to our current information. So pre-testing each and every one of your adult education um, enrollees counts as activity two. So this is not just limited to workforce referrals or career force referrals. This is for all of, like any of your students as well as referrals or coordinated services with other, with our career force partners. Another question. Um, would that last item, including aiding participants and getting transit assistant programs for Metro Transit, would that count? Yes. Yep. Any any information, any costs that you incur on sharing information on those supportive services, including transit assistance program, that would count. You can document that that cost as well, or as part of your estimate. And then, Karen, I see you're saying, is this only for services in conjunction with Career Force or for all programming we provide? This is for all programming that you would be providing, not limited to just the referrals with that are coordinated with Career Force. And Denise, you're asking, are these just hours we bill as contact hours, or are they asking for an estimate of work we do behind the scenes? This is, and this can be, an, this should be an estimate of all the work that you're doing. I admit that we just did this based on contact hours because we didn't know a better way to do it. But at your low, at your consortium level or at your provider level, you should be creating this estimate on whatever way makes sense. But you, you should not just include the contact hours. Think about the behind the scenes work as well. We encourage you to think about all the costs of providing those services and include that as part of your estimate. Good questions. And again, very much like last, like the in section four, the way that you'll document any of those career services is in this uh, four part uh, table, just how much was spent in your, according to your estimate on state ABE grant from state ABE grant funding on this career service, on these career services. How much did you spend from your adult education grant, federal adult education grant on providing those career services? Again, an estimate. How much from your IELCE grant did you uh, spend on those career, uh, career services? 
And if, if there's any other, other funding that you'd like to talk about or share in kind, whatever, you can feel free to include it in the fourth. But again, we're most important, we're focusing most importantly and what we're reporting to the state is most often the state AD funding, the federal adult education grant funding and IELCE grant funding. And again, estimates from your team, from your consortium. Okay, let's go on to section six. Um, section six um, is uh, similar to uh, the same as last year. We're looking at your one-stop contributions as a consortium. So that's your co uh, contributions for Career Force Center and system support. Um, and again, we're looking for July of 2022 to June of 2023. One thing that you can do to think about what your costs or what your contributions are as a consortium is look to your IFA, your infrastructure funding agreement um, with your workforce development area or with your if you have multiple workforce development areas in your consortium, uh, then you'd look at, at multiple at, the, at each workforce development areas IFA um, and look uh, look at where you're providing service and what those agreements look like. Note, you know, we know in some cases that one consortium within a workforce development area maybe is doing more work with that with that uh, career force center or with the system, with the workforce development area, and so maybe they're making a contribution or a more a significant contribution, and that's really in benefit of uh, or on behalf of all the consortium that region or other consortia as well. Um, only the consortium in that situation that is actually making the contribution or is documented in making the doc the contribution should should actually document the contribution here in component six, um, even though it is kind of, you're doing that on behalf of your partners or your other consor neighboring consortia, just the consortium that's actually making the contribution uh, according to the IFA should be documenting that contribution in component six of this, um, of this August reporting submission. And then the way that you document that is just like uh, very similar to last time in terms of the contribution type. But before that, we just want to know, re, uh, just let it remind us, what are the workforce development areas where your consortium is located? So just one additional question, but again, documenting those, those costs or those estimates there, those contributions. See a question here uh, on section five. We'll go back to that as soon as I finish up with section seven. Um, but I'll make sure I address this. Then component seven is um, verification of your consortium state aid um, calculation for uh, fiscal year 24. And so you want to make sure that you look at that contribute uh, that calculation, look at the contact hours. Is that right? Um, look at your school district members. Is that accurate? Um, and any other data that you can verify is you, um, that is used for calculating state adult education aid for the consortium. If you find any inaccurate data, please contact Jody as soon as possible. We're gonna provide more details later in this session. So no worries about that. But I see, I, uh, before we move on, I'd like to just address any uh, Karen's question here. So Karen, you're wondering regarding section five, um, rather than going with a dollar amount per student, would it make more sense to look at our positions and, and maybe create a percentage of time they're working on these tasks and then calculate wages and maybe even benefits based on that? Yes, that is another way that you can create that estimate and that way, however makes sense to you is appropriate. Um, and so if it's easier to do that as a per, uh, the cost as a percentage of your positions, that is absolutely, uh, absolutely appropriate. And that would be a great way to develop that estimate, Karen. For those career service costs. Okay, well, if you have additional questions, we'll have time later on for questions, but let me also, let's move into our legislative update. So it was a very busy legislative year and there was legislative legislation um, that really benefited ad, uh, adult education, our adult education system this year. So one, um, the, uh, the, there is an adjustment to the gross revenue per contact hour cap from $22 to $30. And I know that will be a great benefit to many consortia in the state and, and prevent a lot of destabilizing of, and, uh, of many of our pro, uh, consortia across the state. We also got a general increase in state ABE funding. We also received um, 
uh, uh, connection to future state AB growth with K-12 funding growth. So if K-12 funding grows, ABE funding can grow an equal percentage. And then um, there was a one-time funding to temporarily pay for HSE testing, a one-time pot that, is, that Brandy will talk about a little bit later. And there is a, 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 the exemption where ABE and ECF, ECFE teachers could be exempted from that classification as teacher in school districts and contracts. Um, that exemption was removed, uh, explicit exemption was removed in statute. And that affects uh, Minnesota State Statute 122A.26. And just note on that, that we've received quite a few questions. Unfortunately, MDE is not the lead entity, uh, state agency providing guidance on that, um, on that bill um, or that new statute. That is, um, that guidance is being developed by Pelsby. Um, so the licensing agency, uh, teacher licensing agency. Um, Brad, there was a question about how much funding um, increase. I don't know the exact amount. Uh, I don't know. Um, Jody, thank you. It was about a 2% increase, so about a million dollars. One thing I will say about the, the, the state legislation, there are a couple of these that we were able to promote from through the governor and the governor's bills, such as um, adjusting the gross revenue per contact hour cap, and um, a one-time pot of funding to temporarily pay for HSE testing. Um, but I will say that in terms of the increase in state AB funding and connecting future state AB funding growth with K-12 funding growth, that is all thanks to Literacy Action Network. Literacy Action Network did an excellent job working with legislators, um, sharing the information from each of your ABE consortia and telling the story of why adult education is important and why legislators should remember us. So let's just, I, let's give a round of applause to, um, to Literacy Action Network and all of the amazing work that they did this session. Like, thank you very much. Um, you really advocated and represented our field well. So thank you. Kelly, um, I see your question here. Um, will that statute that I'm guessing you're talking about E here affect teacher licensing for ABE ESL instructors? Will they need a, a license or can that, hey, they have an MS, MA ESL or TESOL to be eligible to teach? So that statute that talks about ESL teachers being able to have a, a different type of master's degree or different type of post-secondary, that did not get changed. That is still in legislation. Um, so that doesn't affect that other um, statute as well. So, so that should not affect that. However, I cannot give exact guidance on this because that guidance is being developed by Pelsby. And then another question from Kathleen, is that increase just added into the pool that is distributed across consortia? Yes, yes, um, that, that increase in funding, 97% um, goes out to the, that went out as part of the state estimate, the initial um, uh, aid calculation and it'll be in the final aid calculation as well. But 3%, just like with every state dollar, uh, state ABE dollar, 3% did go into uh, supplemental services. So there's a small increase for supplemental service funding as well with that. But 97% is going directly out as grants um, to ABE consortia. And Susie, I hear that. Thanks to everyone um, that also heard the call and contacted your representatives and legislators to advocate for changes. Yep. And Susie, you're saying that, okay, so Pelsby is going to be uh, documenting the guidance on, the, on, not on letter E on that statutory change. And each district may have the wiggle room to interpret that guidance. That is, that quite likely is going to be the case. Yeah. You know, but again, I can't give any official guidance yet on that. Okay, let's go forward. And at this point, I am going to turn it over to um, to Jody to talk about adult education funding and service disruption. Jody. All right. Thanks, Brad. Um, so, yep, I will add my shout out to Literacy Action Network for a lot of effective advocacy at the Capitol this year. Um, a lot of things are really good news for our state and for our adult ed system. And um, I'll be talking about sort of how, practically speaking, some of those things work out for our funding for this upcoming year. So before we kind of dive into talking about funding, I just want to make sure that um, I'm really clear about the words I'm using and about some of the abbreviations on these slides. So I'm going to be talking about fiscal years, 
uh, which just to make sure we're all talking about the same thing, I'm talking about the period between July 1st to June 30th of any given year. And when you see FY on the slide, that stands for fiscal year. So right now, uh, fiscal year 23 is the year that just ended at the end of this last June. And we are just in the beginning of FY24. So that is the year that just started on July 1st of this year. So just making sure that we're clear about those what those two years are, because we're going to talk about both of those. And then I also want to say um, UFARs. Uh, some of you I know are more familiar with UFARs than you want to be. Um, but for some of you, that might be a new word. UFARs is just a system of accounting codes. It has to be used by all grantees from MDE. And because all of our adult ed funding flows through MDE, all of you have to use that. Um, but I know some of you don't work for school districts, which makes it a little foreign to you sometimes. So um, just know that UFARS codes are accounting codes and a couple of codes um, that are really important to our funding specifically are, these are finance codes, um, sometimes called FIN codes. So FIN 322 is state adult funding, state adult education funding, and FIN 438 is federal adult education funding. So those are a couple of UFARS codes that are particularly relevant. And then I just want to point out that there are um, certain words here that kind of get used basically interchangeably. So I'm talking about funding, but sometimes we call it aid. The report on the MDE website calls it entitlement. Really, all of those words are just mean to say the money that your program gets to pay teachers and buy Chromebooks and run your programming every year. So just wanted to start there um, to sort of make sure we're all talking about the same things. And then um, on the next slide, I want, first of all, to give you some uh, reminders and things to know about FY23 funding. So that is the funding that just entered, the, the fiscal year that just ended. So I want to remind you, hopefully you, um, hopefully you are aware, that state ABE funds, FIN 322 funds, can be carried over. This is a special provision in state statute. So if you get to the end of a fiscal year, if you get to June 30th and your expenses were a little less than you budgeted, you know, say you had planned to hire a new teacher but weren't able to hire, or there was going to be a new class that was that you were planning to run, but it didn't go. So for whatever reason, your expenses are less than you thought. If there's some funds left over, you still have some time to spend those funds. That is what we sometimes call quarter five. You can spend those funds in the first quarter of the following year. So we are currently in that time period where if there was underspending in your state funding for fiscal year 23, you still have an opportunity to spend it up, which is great news. The only thing to be very careful about is that your business office staff or your accounting staff know that in UFARS, they have to, or with the UFARS codes, they have to code those expenses correctly. So um, that the, the kind of code or the specific category of code within UFARS is a course code. And the course code to be using right now during this period of the year to use up FY23 funds is 003. And really the way we want you to think about that is not to use that for ongoing expenses, but to use it for special one-time things like, oh, we could add some more equipment. Uh, we could pay a staff member to do a one-time curriculum project um, that, you know, sort of a contained extra expense is how we want to encourage you to use those funds if you are in this situation. On the next slide, um, I'll just give you the codes for the next couple of years. Um, for the next couple of years, they are pretty straightforward. So this year, uh, during this time period, when you are um, you know, using, using up any leftover FY23 funds, those need to be course coded 003. A year from now, when you're doing that with FY24 funds, the course code is 004, et cetera. And then the other reminder about FY23 funds. So your federal funds, which are FIN code 438, 
Those funds are in serves, they're in a different financial system than the FIN 322 state funds, and federal funds cannot be used after June 30th of the fiscal year. So those FY23 federal adult education funds are no longer available to you to spend. Um, at this point of the year, what you should be doing is to work with your business office to make sure that somebody in the accounting or business office has drawn down all of your funds and gotten them out of serves and into your organization's bank account. Um, we Every year, <laughs> we have some folks who kind of forget to do that. It's easy because your federal funds are so small compared to your state funds. And also, if you work in a district, your district business office has many, many, many different pots of funding, and these FIN 438 funds is a very small pot compared to others. So please do make sure that you are checking that all of those federal funds have been drawn down out of SERBs. And, and if your program underspent, then you will need to revise your budget in SERVs to make sure that it matches the amount of expenditures and the amount that's being drawn down. So please work on that as soon as you can. Some of you have already done that, thank you very much, um, but make sure that happens no later than September 30th. So that's what you need to know about FY23 funding. Now let's talk about FY24 funding. So this upcoming year's funding. We have run an initial calculation of state funding award amounts, and that is posted on the MDE website. The link, uh, there is a link on this slide. I think Neil can also um, stick that in the chat. And um, if you're wanting more information about that, look for an email that was sent by Neil on June 29th. And on the next slide here, um, I there's also a way just to navigate to that if you can't find the link and you're just on the main MDE website, which is education.mn.gov. You can also go through the, here are the breadcrumbs. You go to the data center, data reports and analytics, and adult basic education entitlement report. So a couple different ways to get to this report. And then notice when you get on the landing page, you have to select the year, which is the year the calculation was run, not the fiscal year. Sorry about that. That always frustrates me every time, but you do select 2023 in the dropdown, your consortium's fiscal agent, and then you run the report and you should get there. So um, just a reminder, as Brad told you, one of the components, component seven of your required August submission report is to verify this initial state aid for FY24. So probably the biggest, most important thing you want to verify is contact hours. You also want to just eyeball the other things, including your school district members, take a look at the other data that's there on that report, make sure it all looks right. If anything looks incorrect, please let me know as soon as possible. We will, we can, correct mistakes. Uh, if it was a mistake on our end, we will absolutely correct it. If it was a mistake on your end, let's talk about that. Um, we can sometimes correct things. It will depend a little. Um, if everything looks fine, if you look at it and it looks like what you were expecting, then you don't need to email me. You just need to verify that on reporting component seven of the August reporting submission document. Here's just a screenshot, an example of what that report looks like with um, just some you know, red circles to kind of point out to you the things, the particular things you want to be looking for. At the top, that just shows the drop-down menu where you, uh, you know, select the year and your consortium and hit run report. This is the example from Metro North, or um, which fiscal agent is in Okahennepin. Um, and then on in the left column here that says consortium, that is where we suggest that you eyeball and make sure that your member districts looked, look correct. Occasionally, we have the scenario where some districts have merged or some other change has happened to districts and that can mess up this calculation a little bit. So take a look at that, make sure it looks right. And then that smaller box, red box in the middle that says count, that is one of the places your contact hours shows up here. So make sure that your contact hours look correct. 
So those are some of the things that you can be looking for on that report. But do, yeah, do put your eyes on all of it. So a few notes about our state ABE funding this year and the funding calculation. So I hope you all, nobody is surprised to hear that we used actual hours this year from May 1st, 2022 through April 30th, 2023. We are, we have, are no longer using pre-COVID hours. We did that for three fiscal years in a row and now we are back to using actual hours. Next thing to know is that, as we've mentioned, thanks to advocacy at the legislature, we did get a 2% bump in the total. If you take last year's total compared to this year's total, it's 2% higher. What that means is when we have a higher total amount that we are, we are dividing out, Plus, we have a lower number of contact hours because we are still considerably down from where we were in terms of statewide contact hours before COVID. So the result of that is a much higher contact hour rate. So the, so the contact hour rate in this initial calculation is $11.05 per hour, which is far higher than the contact hour rate has been for a long time, maybe ever. One thing this means is each contact hour is worth a lot more. So many of you hit the contact hour revenue growth cap, um, which is bound to happen when, when contact hours are worth more, but is something you might notice on your um, when you look at your entitlement report. And another thing um, just that's different about this year's funding is that gross revenue per contact hour cap, again, thanks to some excellent advocacy at the legislature, was increased to $30 an hour. It had been $22 an hour for a long time. I took a look yesterday. I saw that 18 out of 38 of our consortia had a higher award amount that year as a result of that legislative change. That was a significant help in terms of sort of leveling out funding um, and keeping your awards as high as possible this year, even when contact hours went down. So that was the exact right change at the exact right time. And then I want to, uh, you know, keep you aware of how of the timeline for what we will be doing next and the final funding calculation. So right now, as soon as you can, if you haven't already, make sure that somebody from, you know, your your consortium manager, your fiscal agent folks are looking at the initial calculation. If you see anything wrong, let me know ASAP. In the month of July, we will work on a final calculation, and then in once we have all of the all of that figured out, in August we will run award letters. Your award letter is your official notification that includes your final amount of state and federal aid. Um, Clarice, I do see your question about that net entitlement. Yes, I believe you are correct that that is your total. However, I do not have that report up on my screen. I would be happy to connect with you one-on-one uh, -on -one and kind of talk things through and give you an overview. I'm happy to do that with anybody, new manager or not. Um, there are a lot of different factors in your aid calculation, and sometimes it is nice to just look at yours specifically and try to figure out what it all means. Dwayne, do we have an estimate of the federal amount per contact hour? We do not yet, I'm sorry to say. Uh, let's see. Erin, I, um, I am not sure I understand your question. Um, so I'm going to keep going. Maybe we can circle back to that if we have a chance at the end of this section here. OK, I do want to. Um, make sure that everybody hears me say that there is something um, important about this year's calculation that uh, is a little different than ever other years. This year, we are almost entirely certain that there will be a change from your initial award amount posted now to your final award amount that will be posted in August and you will get an award letter. There are two reasons why. One is because, as Brad announced at the beginning of our webinar today, we have a new ABE consortium. That consortium was not included in the initial calculation because they were not yet approved at that point. Uh, the, it is a very small new consortium, so that will not change things very much, but it does mean a little bit of a change. 
And the second is because of a possible, possible service disruption adjustment to some consortia. As a result of those two factors, most consortia will see a small decrease and consortia who get approved for service disruption adjustment will see an increase. So we just want you to know and not be surprised when that happens, if it happens, which it likely will. So just a few words then about service disruption. So um, service disruption adjustment is a provision in state statute that, that is there really as a safeguard. If something really out of your control drastically affects your program, it's a way to sort of protect and minimize the loss of contact hour revenue. Essentially, during the last three years, we applied a statewide service disruption adjustment because of COVID by using those pre-COVID hours. We are not doing that this year, which means we are now, uh, it is possible for individual consortia this year to apply for a service disruption adjustment if they fit these criteria from statute on this slide that I'm not gonna read to you. On the next slide, um, gives you a sense of where we're at. We have run a service, we are, we are running the service disruption adjustment process in two phases. We have completed phase one. That first phase was open to consortia who were sub, who are subject, who will be subject to the $30 gross revenue per contact hour cap and were therefore seeing a loss of more than 10% of funding potentially. We had three applications in phase one. We approved all three and those adjustments have already been made. We already did that before we ran the initial calculation. So that phase is complete. Now we are in phase two. Phase two is currently open. When we ran the initial calculation, we saw that there was there actually were no consortia who are seeing more than a 10% decrease. I will acknowledge there are a couple of you out there who are managers of consortia that are very, very close, like a 9% decrease. However, it technically, uh, no one is decreasing more than 10%, which is great news. We were really afraid of just massive sort of variability in terms of funding this year, and it hasn't really played out that way. So that's good news. So phase two is only open for sort of a, a more uh, smaller subset of consortia. So phase two is for consortia who have multiple providers. In other words, consortia where some of the funding is flowing downstream from the fiscal agent to other districts or other programs. And that one or more of those providers is looking at at least a 15% decrease. That and those criteria are set in state statute. Um, that's those are the criteria uh, for eligibility for this phase two part of the application. That application is due on July 17th. We have so far received one application. I am curious and will open it up. You are not required uh, to know we didn't require an intent to apply or anything, but I am curious to know from those of you listening, if anybody else knows that you are working on a service disruption adjustment application in phase two and are planning to submit it, that would be nice to know in the chat. And if you are uh, not sure uh, what I'm talking about or want to look back at it, um, look for a detailed email that Neil sent to our fiscal agent list on June 30th. If you are not the manager of the fiscal agent entity of your consortium, if you're a manager at a provider, for example, um, then you need to talk to your consortium manager, connect with that person to find out whether you would apply or whether you would qualify. And then last of all, I just want to reiterate, kind of already said this, but want to say this again. Um, since last fall, uh, we've been using this metaphor of our funding is like a pizza. So whenever we change the size of one slice, it changes the size of everybody else's slices. So just so you know, the fact that we are running the service disruption adjustment means that we may be able to increase revenue a little bit for consortia who are seeing or providers who are seeing a significant decrease, 
but it does mean that increase results in a small decrease everywhere else. Hopefully, um, you know, very, very minimal, not enough to significantly affect your programming. All right, yes. Um, thank you, Brad, for the answer about gross revenue per contact hour cap and what that means. And yeah, I think I will turn it back over to Brad at this point. Thank you so much, Jody. Okay, so let's talk about our the annual SID and distance learning license fees. So it, again, uh, we have some good news for you that uh, NDE through St. Paul uh, Public Schools, it will be paying the annual tech fees um, in, for 23-24. Um, in other years, each consortia pays Literacy Minnesota a fee for their share of that SID license and those distance learning licenses. Um, uh, and this year, uh, we have some unspent um, federal funding again um, due to underspending. And so we are able to pay for those entire tech fees with Saint, uh, um, utilizing St. Paul as a single source grant um, with those federal funds. However, just note that each consortia, you will still need to sign a contract with Literacy Minnesota for use of those licenses. And you will be receiving information, information noting what your typical fee would be so that you can plan maybe for next year as well. But note that that won't be an invoice that you have to pay. Again, I'm acknowledging this underspending is a unique situation, fingers crossed. And the plan is that starting next year that consortia will be invoiced and paying for their share of the SID and distance learning licenses. So this is a one-time um, situation again, that, or a unique situation, obviously not a one-time since we ended up doing it last year, but we hope that this is a unique situation that will not be repeated um, free, uh, frequently uh, because we hope that each and every one of, of you spends your federal funding. So that um, so we hope that this is a one uh, this is maybe uh, this will not be repeated again um, next year. So don't plan for this to be repeated. This situation to be repeated next year. And then a question um, in the chat um, is the total of federal funding this year the same as last year? Actually, we did receive like I I think it was a very small increase in federal funding as well this year, Dwayne. So there might be a small increase in federal funding. Also, uh, Clarice. Uh, Question, do we sign a new Literacy Minnesota contract every year? Yes, you do. Um, and Literacy Minnesota will send you the contract. Yep. All right. Well, let's take a break. Let's take a five minute break. We'll reconvene at 2.10 and we'll jump right into professional development and, and our other topics. So we will see you in five minutes. The next component of our conversation today is about professional development, staff training policy, and onboarding resources. So uh, uh, we announced uh, last month that there is a new adult education staff training policy, and we've been working with many of you over the last year uh, or more to, to develop this policy. So the only new requirement that is listed here is that all uh, within the first 12 months of hire, um, all uh, adult education staff are required to complete ABE foundations. Um, that, that can be an online course, an in-person session, or sometimes it is offered as a webinar. Um, all of the other components of this policy have already been required before implementation. Um, so just note like the CASAs and TABE implementation, the distance and blending learning, blended learning basics, TV, uh, uh, teacher verification model certification, and standard adult diploma 101, those have always already been required. And now it's all just documented in one convenient place. And then there are also some strongly encouraged trainings um, listed in the policy as well, especially around our, our content standards training. Um, just note that, uh, that there are some exemptions here. Any staff who worked with an adult education role prior uh, with an, an approved provider with, uh, before July 1, 2023, those staff are exempt from this policy. 
also are from this training, but also strongly encouraged to make sure that they do complete that training, um, even, even though. And also any staff that have successfully completed the Hamlin University graduate course, because there are only ABE licensure program in the state, and that program course is called Introduction to Ed uh, Adult Education, or EDUC 7601. And if you have any questions or want to discuss any special circumstances in complying with this policy, please talk with our um, Astrid Leiden from our team. And just uh, the documentation that is required is that all trainings required by this policy must be entered as a staff training history item in each staff person's SID record. Um, uh, we do recommend that other trainings be documented as well because that can make uh, life easier as you're completing your narrative or doing other professional development planning. Note that that's encouraged or recommended but not required. Um, and then starting in 2024, um, consortia will be required to use SID to report on the required staffing participation as part of the August reporting submission. So next year you'll see more about that. At this point, I wanna make sure we, we talk about some of the resources available to you on staff training and onboarding. So I'm gonna turn it over to Lindsay Hoost from Atlas to talk a little bit more, Lindsay. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I am going to briefly talk about three resources. Uh, the first, ABE Foundations. Then I will uh, briefly uh, remind us about the suggested training pathways. And then uh, talk about a new uh, opportunity, the Mentorship Experience Pilot. So first, just want to remind you for ABE Foundations, there is still time to register for the pre-conference that will be in person at Summer Institute. Um, the pre-conference will be the 15th and the 16th, a Tuesday and a Wednesday. So definitely we encourage you to uh, register or uh, encourage others you know to register since that is uh, now a requirement to complete. And then the, the, the other uh, mode, the other way of completing that requirement is the online course. And that is currently being transferred from Schoology over to Canvas. And the expected release date of that updated course will be uh, coinciding with Summer Institute, August 15th. So watch for a newsletter article uh, in the near future with more details about that. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is the Suggested Training Pathways resource. This is review for some, new for some, um, but I want to navigate quickly to uh, the Atlas website to share uh, where this optional resource lives. So in the resources library on the Atlas site, um, if we scroll down to the Minnesota Adult Ed Staff Library, it is in this uh, right-hand menu. So the suggested training pathways live here. Uh, and you can see there are five different uh, roles that we have um, identified and addressed in these documents. And then each of them have their own interactive PDF. So I'm just gonna open one of them briefly. The administrator uh, PDF, uh, looks like this. Uh, all of the documents have a similar look to them. Um, and on the top, we identify core training. And these core trainings uh, were decided upon after input and uh, ideas from people in various roles, teachers, admins, um, et cetera. We've shared it at uh, last summer institute. Um, and so with a lot of guidance, we came up with these as core trainings and um, refer to the PD policy as far as what's required. This is, again, a, this is all suggestions um, as far as when you might complete trainings that are um, core to your role. So uh, there's a suggestion for how you might break it up. And you'll notice it's about over 18 months. Um, and so kind of communicating like this doesn't need to happen all at one time, but how can we stretch it out um, and, and have a plan? And then the bottom of each of the documents also has some specialized training options. Uh, this particular document has some links to uh, learn more about different resources, stay connected um, with the events calendar, the connect newsletter, um, other documents like the instructor one has some specific uh, additional resources um, or training options like the CCRS implementation cohort, the, the new numeracy cohort, every star resources, etc. So kind of trying to put everything on one page. 
And then there is a tool um, that will bring you to a document that you will not be able to edit unless you make a copy. You can make a copy up at file and then you will be able to kind of take the suggestions from the document, but then make it your own, add things from your local district or program, um, add some notes, use this for yourself, with your supervisor, uh, with your staff, um, and this again, optional, but just a way to kind of capture uh, a plan. I've been purposely skipping over this observation and mentoring piece. Uh, it says coming soon on all of the documents. Um, and uh, I am gonna talk about that as the third piece. Uh, this is very exciting. And yes, I am gonna actually put all of these links um, that I'm talking about in the chat right when I'm uh, done talking. So thank you for reminding me. I will put the links in the chat. Um, so this mentorship experience pilot uh in starting january of 2023 so just about seven months ago uh we had 11 task force members uh come together we met five times uh we talked about kind of what what would it look like to develop a pd opportunity around mentoring adult educators and these were the goals that we had and i won't read all of the goals but um but some of them, some things I just want to point out that we were looking to supplement what's already happening. And we know that uh, in various districts and various programs, different resources are available to us across the state. And so we wanted to offer uh, a way for um, programs, for individuals uh, to take part in some onboarding mentorship experiences um, if you choose to. Um, and this is not just for instructors, it's for managers, um, coordinators, support staff, like it, it's all roles are, are welcome. Um, so I'm going to uh, quickly uh, just share a little bit uh, from this flyer. And again, I'll put the link to this flyer if you want to use it uh, to kind of spread the word. That is what it will be for. Um, <clears throat> thank you for those of you dropping links already. Uh, so this mentorship experience pilot, the purpose is really to support Minnesota AB professionals. Um, through this mentor-mentee relationship. And who are mentors and mentees? Like mentors, not people who have all the answers, but really uh, the, the definition we landed on was uh, an experienced professional who has a particular skill set, and we all have a particular skill set needed by the mentee. Uh, it's a colleague who nurtures professional growth in a mentee by sharing knowledge and insights and supporting the mentee in their uh, professional learning and growth. So anybody can be a mentor. Uh, we all have something to offer. And so if that is an opportunity uh, that interests you, stay tuned. In the next couple minutes, I'll share, I'll tell you how you can uh, apply to be involved. And then a mentee, anybody who is wanting to, um, to professionally grow in certain areas and, and want to have the support of someone in a similar, similar role. Um, and so if you're a new manager or if you're a new teacher and you want to uh, be paired with someone who has uh, more experience as a manager, more experience as a teacher, um, that this is for you. So definitely an opportunity to further develop leadership skills, regardless of if you're a mentor or a mentee. Um, and ultimately, this is going to benefit our students. Uh, so the pilot that I'm talking about um, is... Uh, Yes, it is totally available to staff who are not new as well. It is kind of tailored to that, but anybody is is welcome to apply. Um, so the commitment is going to be a 12 week commitment. Um, and this pilot is going to start November 3rd. Um, there will be a virtual kickoff orientation. Uh, there will be six mentor mentee meetings in throughout the course of the 12 weeks, and those would be decided upon by the mentor mentee pair, um, just meeting six times within the 12 weeks to kind of check in. I will be helping facilitate this experience through checking in via Canvas. We're going to have a, a place where we can post questions and kind of check in, see how it's going. Um, and so there will be that facilitation. Um, as well. And then there are CEUs and a stipend for participating and, and offering feedback on how we can make this a better experience because we do want to offer it again. Um, 
I won't read this whole list, but the the options of what you could choose to focus on are pretty much endless. Um, so this these are just topics to kind of get you thinking about what might I want to really work with a mentor on or, or brainstorm about, brainstorm with someone about. Um, and we're going to really encourage the creation of SMART goals. Um, so creating a SMART goal with your mentor um, and then revisiting that in those six meetings. How's it going? Do we need to change it? Do we need to tweak it? Um, anything else? Uh, do we need to completely rewrite it? And is there a new goal that now has surfaced? Um, so just uh, really wanting to make this feel tangible, like there are tangible results we're, we're working towards. Because this is going to be virtual. Um, the orientation will be virtual. Um, all the meetings, we the expectation is that you can meet virtually um, just to make it accessible, sustainable. Um, we, we will be able to use some Atlas funds to then support in-person meetings. If you, if you're, if the mentor and the mentee would like to meet up once, um, and you're in different parts of the state or whatnot, like we would be able to support you doing that. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, the timeline for this, right now we're recruiting mentors and mentees. A newsletter article just went out yesterday and I will put the link in the chat in just a moment. Um, and with more information about it. But if you are at all interested in being a mentor or a mentee, um, or you want to share this opportunity with your staff, please do. Um, we are recruiting mentors and mentees. The deadline, September 15th, um, for the pilot. And then uh, for mentors, we are going to do a brief interview process, just kind of 20 to 30 minute interview process. Um, and so by October 20th, we hope to then have pairings of mentors, mentees, and we're gonna use the applications and the interviews to really figure out what would be a good pairing, roles, um, experience, interests, et cetera. Um, so that will happen before the pilot starts then on the 3rd of November. In the afternoon, we will have uh, some time where mentors can can meet together and mentees will meet together and, and have some training there. Um, and then we will have some time together uh, where the pairs you'll get to kind of meet and, and kick off that that start. One more thing I want to mention is that everything I just shared, like that's the pilot. This is we're super excited. We're we're at this point um, and we're going to gather feedback and we're going to tweak it. And then we want to offer it widely. And so our hope is to offer it uh, like three different, have three different entry points throughout the year. So this is kind of an example, um, but uh, like September, February, May, where we would have an orientation entry point. But then that means that we would be accepting mentor applications and mentee interest forms on a rolling basis. Um, so spread the word that this is a new thing. Uh, if people apply for this pilot and aren't selected because we didn't have a good uh, match just because of the number and this is new and whatnot, we will save those applications because it is going to be offered again. Um, so we definitely want anybody who is interested to take advantage of this opportunity. Um, okay, so some questions, and then I'm going to put some links in the chat. Is this available? Yes, so it's available to everyone. Um, and then can we apply more than once for different topics? I would say... Um, I am, I'm thinking this might be what you're asking, but please let me know if not. Um, if you, uh, you can apply. And then if there are a couple different things you want to talk about with your uh, mentor, um, then, or mentee, uh, then that would be totally fine. Um, you can talk about more than one thing. Uh, if you want to apply to be a mentee one year, and then you want to apply to be a mentor another year. Yes. Um, oh, yeah. And I would say, Yes, I, I don't have a specific answer. I'm really glad that you asked that, but I don't see why not, um, why you couldn't apply to be a part of this more than once. Um, I think, so thank you, Clarice, for those questions. And then, awesome. Okay, thank you, Neil, for answering the other one. So I'll just put some links in the chat so you can kind of uh, check out those resources that I talked about um, at a later date, but thanks for letting me come on here and share about them.
Thank you, Lindsay. Let's go to the next slide here. Um, so just a note that there will be a statewide professional development survey that is going out and we encourage, we really would love your support and for you to encourage your staff to complete this. This uh, professional development survey will be available uh, September 18th to October 6th. And the, this is very important, uh, this, the results, because we're going to use this data to support professional development decisions with our adult education field with upcoming events, as well as in making determinations for what to fund and how much to put in funding for AD supplemental service grants for FY25 to FY27, fiscal year 25 through fiscal year 27. So just stay tuned. Let's go into the next section here, and that is accountability. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so just note that we do have some state purchase cost uh, computer-based test administrations that are available to you. A Google form to indicate interest in how many CASAs e-tests you would be interested in will be sent to consortium fiscal agents in August to the consortium managers. The test publisher's requirements must be met in order to accept those test administrations, meaning that the test publisher's CASAs, they do have some training requirements and certification requirements that must be met before you can actually receive those test administrations. Next slide. And we also um, just share with us in the chat, um, there, there's been some talk about doing a statewide remote testing hub. If we had a state supported remote testing hub available for post testing students in CASAs or TABE, would your consortium be interested in referring students for remote post testing? How many students would you refer potentially to remote testing in a year? Again, we're just asking for an estimate on your part. Are you interested? And if so, how many students would you refer to a remote testing hub, again for post testing, CASAs or TABE? in the over the course of a year in theory. So please just share that information in the chat. And let's go to the next slide. Please continue to enter that in the chat. And note, since it is a new fiscal year, there is a new assessment policy that has been approved by the feds. And so if you go to mnabe.org to our policies page, you will see a link to our new assessment policy for 2023, 2024. So you can download that policy there. There are no major changes from the prior year, admittedly. So just please, uh, you can go there if you, uh, if you wanna download the latest policy. Let's go to the next slide. We do know that some tests are, some new tests are being approved. CASA's Math Goals version two and CASA's Steps for ESL are being approved by the U.S. Department of Education. We just received notice while we've been in this session that the feds will complete the step one official approval in the federal register tomorrow. And so that will kickstart us in this seven part, uh, set, that'll be the first step in a seven step process that we need to do before local programs can actually utilize the test for NRS, the new test for NRS purposes. And note that the biggest step here is we need to add this to our current our current year assessment policy, and we need to submit it to the US Department of Education, and they need to give us official approval about the revision, about adding these new tests before any local programs can utilize those tests for NRS purposes. Um, in terms of an estimated date of when we can use steps, we do not have that available yet because we do not know how long it will take to go through these seven steps. In past years, to go through that once the step one is complete, it's taken anywhere from one to six months to go through the rest of the steps um, of this process. And it really depends on how long it takes for the federal government to review, how much time can we actually, if the test vendors still don't have paper copies of these new tests available, or they didn't last time we checked. So we can't actually even do a test review um, within our SPARC group. So there's a lot of things that are dependent on the federal government and test vendors. So we don't know, we do not have a timeline at this point in time. So just FYI, we'll move forward as quickly as we are able to, but we do need to go through this official process before you can start utilizing the new tests. Let's go to the next slide. 
And just remember that there is required assessment training. And, um, and so, uh, and this training is offered through Southwest ABE and also through the test vendors. Um, this is for initial uh, certification and any, anytime a new person is going to start implementing these assessments. And every staff person that's utilizing the assessments needs to get recertified every five years. You can get more information in those links there. Let's go to the next slide. And also just, there are some upcoming trainings uh, for uh, test certification sessions on Friday, um, August 11th. And so there's some information there. You can find information on registering for those assessments in the chat. Thank you, Neil, for being right on top of that. I'm gonna turn it over to Brandy now to talk about more accountability um, topics such as our targets. Thanks so much, Brad. So we've been talking about our MSG targets. And of course, for this fiscal year that's ending on June 3rd, we're looking at a 27.5% as our statewide target. And starting on July 1, we began um, a new target for next fiscal year at 28%. And so knowing these targets, if you go to the next slide, please, this brings us into program improvement. You've heard about it a couple of times throughout different web chats, but also throughout some emails that you've seen recently. So 2023 ABE report card is going to be released fall of 2023, and some consortia may be flagged to participate in program improvement based off of that 27.5% target. Next slide. As you can see here, this is what the report card will look like. So this is last year's report card. We did not have program improvement, but we still um, highlighted what the targets would be just to kind of give you um, an idea of what you would be looking at. So when the report cards do come out this fall towards the end of August, you'll be finding your placement and seeing where you fall um, within the target placement. The next slide. So program improvement is a state required process for consortia whose measurable skills gains MSGs fall 30% under that state weighted target. So again, we mentioned it's 27.5% in both ABE and ESL. So that means that your program, if they fall, if your consortia falls at 19.25 or below, then you would fall within the program improvement policy and requirements. And for this year, we're going to be talking about program improvement being implemented into LEAD and those emails everyone's been receiving. So let's talk a little bit about LEAD. So LEAD is program improvement for the process of 2024 is going to involve that opportunity for all Minnesota's ABE managers and coordinators and even LEAD teachers to participate. And if you can, Neil, post the two links in, you'll have one is the flyer, which gives you some information just on what LEAD is specifically. But then also we're going to have extra seats. And within those extra seats, we're asking individuals that do not fall within program improvement if you would like to participate through an application process. So the program improvement is a state required process like we had mentioned and some seats being available uh, we want to encourage individuals that know that they will not fall within program improvement to apply, especially those new consortium managers and uh, directors. And the deadline for that is going to be on August 25th. Two emails have already gone out with that application link. But again, Neil has put that in the chat. So you have that access here as well. There is going to be a stipend offered. And yes, that is going to be for both those that are required through program improvement and as well as those that want to apply and participate in it as well. Um, are there any questions about program improvement or about the lead process and how we're going to do things this fiscal year? Yeah, Brandy, one question in the chat. Will programs be flagged at 30% below target rates for both ABE and ESL level gains or for either ABE or ESL level gains? So Perfect is it combined question. or is it separate based on ESL and ABE levels? Yes, thank you for asking that, Eric. It's going to be either or. So you may have a consortium that falls below an ESL, but not ABE or vice versa. 
and we've seen some consortia that fall below in both ABE and ESL. So that's a conversation that we'll have once we um, are able to identify individuals from the report card and have uh, a conversation on what needs to be done within that category, if it's either or or both. Does that help? Perfect. Are there any other questions about program improvement or lead participation? Nothing in the chat right now, so I think you can go move on. Fantastic. I just want to put out, we'd love to have your application. Please um, send out your fillers. If you have any questions, you can always email me specifically. Now we're going to go into high school equivalency updates. So this first update is just, of course, communications. If you're needing to contact us, that mde.abe website is always the best communications. If you're looking for verifications, age waivers, records, or any other questions about high school equivalency, if you receive um, an individual asking you specifically for a records request, we really would appreciate if you just give them the records request form instead of sending them on to us because our first step is to give them that form. So if you don't have it updated, if you have them printed out for in-person or if you have it saved on your computer, go ahead and just go to the website and try to download the most updated form that we have. Um, as well, because HiSET has been added to the state, as you remember. And so those records request forms will identify HiSET and or GED, not just GED anymore. So we greatly appreciate it. It will hopefully um, lower down some of those records requests that we get through our email and phone calls. The next is um, manager GED access. So a lot of individuals kind of do it a different way. Some people individually email, some people go through GED operations, and now that we have high set. So if you are someone in your consortia or program are needing to get GED access, manager access, or high set access, our goal is for you to request through the request form and it's on the websites. So you have GED operations, our PSI Zendesk, and those two links are being added to the chat by Neil. And so if you can take those down, you can always just Google them or if you want to flag them on your bookmarks. But once you submit that request form, they send it to us and then that's when we're able to do our approval. So it just keeps down on different um, text threads and it's an easier process to get it to us at a quicker rate. The last is about our any HSE updates. So GED, as of July 1, started an additional $6 charge to computer-based testing, and that's in person. So it's a $36 total charge per subtest, but that is in-person computer-based testing, not online proctored. That is staying the same. Um, they've also had a conversation about they were going to lower the discounted retakes down to one, but they've decided to keep it at its current policy. So we still have two discounted retakes currently, but keep in mind that that may change because there was conversation about that. HiSET in person is our hub center that is testing in person, paper and computer-based testing. We still have other test centers that are onboarding. And if you are interested in learning to become a HiSET test center, or if you want information on possibly bringing HiSET to your center for curriculum, you can always go to this link and submit a ticket straight to PSI, and they will respond to you effectively on which department needs to work with you about uh, onboarding. The subsidy has been active, as you can see. So that subsidy is the same for either HiSET or GED. So with the new legislation and this big funding fee, uh, that we have available for full test battery, it is MNHSE free, and that will take care of all testing fees, one per subtest for each student. So in GED, that is four, and with HiSET, that is five times that they could use it. They cannot use this for retakes. So re talk to your testers and let them know economically use it for the first time on each subtest, and they will have the entire subtest and battery taken care of. Are there any questions on any HSC updates? Retake fee. Retake fee is supposed to be $10 by GED. 
and then as well as high set, it's ten dollars. It says it's an administration fee, so it's ten dollars per. Is there any other questions in the chat? I don't think I see any. All right. Well, I will be moving on and passing it over to Julie. Thank you, Brandy. There are plenty of transition updates. Uh, the first one is transitions to employment. I want to mention that the Department of Employment and Economic Development received almost $1.8 in total investments for the biennium fiscal year 24-25, uh, and these funds will be going to targeted populations and youth, and there's plenty of funds that will be used for individual placement and support. So all I'm saying here is uh, be on the lookout for additional funding that will probably be able to serve the majority of our learners. Then moving on to um, some of the training opportunities that are available, we do have the Child Development Associate Credential. There's going to be a training that's offered um, at Minneapolis College, at Community and Technical College, and it will be in um, an event that is designed for like the FACS, Family and Consumer Science teachers and school districts, but they are opening it up to adult basic education as well because they realize that there are some programs that still offer this credential. So there are three slots available if you are interested in attending this um, training and networking event, uh, please email me and I will let the, the coordinator know that of your interest. I think it would be uh, great just to network and possibly bring in your school district personnel as well. I also want to remind people that the Empower to Educate uh, opportunities is still out there. It, it is for anyone who wants to begin a career in child uh, child care, and you do not have to speak English fluently in order to participate in this. Um, you can uh, you can fill or help an individual or go online there's applications the applications are in english spanish or somali and they will connect you to a local workforce advisor um, there's uh, funding for training and there is funding after you complete the training there's help navigating technology and they can also guide you into some of the post-secondary programs that exist um, Again, there's a link in the chat and that, that will get you to that uh, application form. So please share this with all the teachers in your programs because they're the ones most likely to know which individuals are interested in beginning a career in child care. And then there is the follow your heart to a caring career. And this is... Uh, a promotional campaign through DEED, uh, sponsored through the Department of Human Services. And the idea is to get more people interested in taking advantage of the training um, that's available. Uh, we are, everyone knows this in Minnesota, we are down so many in the healthcare field and we are putting, or there's a lot of funding going into training. They have translated all these materials into the languages that you see on this slide. Uh, there's a link you can go to where you can find all these translated flyers. They also have social media graphics um, and other resources that would be beneficial for people um, that are offering trainings in healthcare because there are many programs that do the personal care assistant, nursing assistant, um, home health aid, all of these resources can be used to promote your own programming for those purposes. Next slide. All right, transitions to post-secondary. 
Just want to mention that there are several pilots currently happening at Minnesota State that will impact adult basic education learners who are trying to transition to post-secondary. Um, I will briefly discuss some of these pilots, but if you want more information, you can go to uh, the Strategic Partnerships webpage. So um, for learners transitioning to post-secondary, one thing is multiple measures. And as many of you know, there's a shift away from using the AccuPlacer as the one instrument to place a learner into, uh, into courses. Instead, they're trying to use multiple measures. And in many cases, that means the high school GPA. That doesn't work for a lot of our learners that come from other countries. And so we are trying to push for like um, GED scores on, on some of the, the tests for GED, the uh, practice tests or tape scores, et cetera. But you have to work with your local college to find out um, what they are what they're using for multiple measures. Again, this is in a pilot stage um, for for the uh, Minnesota State. There's guided self placement, which falls under multiple measures, which allows the learner to place themselves as where they see fit in um, in in course placement. And again, you need to talk to your local campus to find out if they're participating in this. And finally, there's math pathways. This is a move away from this prerequisite model to a, a co-requisite model. And there's more information in the link provided in the chat. All of these are happening and uh, it's very important to ensure that you are connecting with your local community colleges to be aware of what pilots they're participating in, because this would really open doors for a lot of the learners. Then I want to mention the ability to benefit a uh, state plan pilot partnerships. Um, the, uh, again, just a reminder, the, the idea behind this or the purpose of this is to provide more pathways into college for adults with no high school diploma, GED. And these individuals are disproportionately low income and people of, of color. Um, Minnesota State it said this supports this Equity 2030 and the state's legislature attainment goal. It helps reduce barriers between secondary and post-secondary pathways by supporting strong collaboration between colleges and adult basic education uh, programs. So two, two uh, partnerships that have really um, are, are kind of taking the lead on this are Pine Technical College in St. Croix River Education District, SCRED ABE. And they have, I think, three or four pathways already developed and ready for learners to be involved in. It's like EMT, um, nursing, um, welding diploma. And then there's Minnesota State Southeast with Winona and Red Wing ABE. And the partnerships there have also approved career pathways in, in welding and a few other uh, pathways. There's eight other partnerships between ABE and the local community college that are taking place. These are all in various stages and discussions are happening. Um, but realize that the value this brings to the adult learner is the ability to work on both high school diploma or the equivalency while also completing college coursework. Um, it's getting rid of that prerequisite model and moving more towards a co-requisite um, and it allows them to access federal financial aid for their college coursework while also working on their diploma or high school equivalency. Um, in the chat, you can see a link to a document where you can see which, which institutions or campuses are working with what ABE partners and where, where they are in that process. If you haven't been involved or your program hasn't been involved in this, it might be a good idea, again, to reach out to the local community college to see if they are interested in this uh, ability to benefit. 
transitions to training. Uh, the Pathways to Prosperity, commonly known as P2P, RFPs have been announced. They're open and available. Um, remember that there are three different categories. It's Bridge to Career Pathway, Individualized Training Pathway, and On-Ramp to Career Pathways. The deadline is 5 o'clock uh, August 28th for these grants. Uh, there will be an informational webinar on July 17th from 10 to 1130. Um, and there's a link where you can get more information on these grants. The ABE has been very involved and is a required partner in two of the grants. And I just want to make sure that people are aware of this, aware that partners may be coming to you asking if you'll participate in a P2P grant. I just ask that you make sure that your program is an actual partner and that they're just not um, signing off on the grant, that you're very involved in the grant development. Um, these are state funded uh, grants and they have more flexibility around the, how the funding can be spent more than federal funds. So when you're working on this, consider building in time for curriculum development, navigator services, time to meet with training instructors, et cetera. The stuff that we typically can't fund or don't have time or money to do with regular funding, this is a great opportunity to build it into a P2P grant. Then I wanted to mention that we are moving on with into the second year of our online statewide training courses pilot. Um, again, these are statewide courses, meaning any adult basic education learner across the state who's at the appropriate level for the course can participate in this course. They are all online, but we ask that the local referring uh, consortium provide support to that individual if they need additional support to complete um, the coursework. And the courses that will be offered this year are Health Care Core Course, which will begin September 15th, Microsoft Office Specialist Course, which will begin September 27th, Paraprofessional Training Course will begin in September, and then we have the Test of Essential Academic Skills or TEAS Preparation Course, which begins September 5th. A lot of people have been doing a great job in making sure these get into their community education catalogs and promoting it um, throughout their school districts so that it, um, learners are aware that it's available to them. And uh, if people have questions about that, they can contact me. You can find more detail on these about these courses in the link that was provided. Um, and maybe I will stop. Are there any questions on that section? Yeah, uh, Kelly, this or uh, Julie, this is Brad. So Kelly had a question. Will other or additional online statewide courses be offered throughout the year? Not at this time. Um, that's something we could discuss at some point in time. Um, and I think that would actually be something to consider, but currently no. If you have an idea, Kelly, please send it my way. <laughs> and then Penny asks, is there work being done so that we can, that registration and attendance policies are the same for each class? Um, I think I need to touch base with you, Penny. Uh, I know that last year they were developed differently for whatever worked for the, the consortium offering it. Um, and if this has caused uh, issues, then we should discuss this and work out um, work out a process that would work for everyone. Excellent. Yeah. And then Clarice asked a question about what is ABE's role? How do we re how do we report our work on this in SID? Um, there is. Uh, so what happens is when you refer a learner. 
and they contact and enroll in the class, that cl or that program contacts, for instance, Clarice, your program, and tells you the hours that the, the individual has been accumulating. Does that make sense? Um, I can also reach out to you individually and, and um, explain this, or possibly if other people have questions, and it looks like what kind of do students require to enroll in these programs? Erin, it is just, um, they have to be an adult basic education student, and the spreadsheet tells what level or edu uh, educational function level they need to be able to participate in the course. Um, but we could, um, what do I mean by, uh, but we could uh, create a document that I can send out to the field that would provide more information on how to enroll for each particular one. Social security should not, we ask for it, but it is not required. Do you mean we can count the hours? Yes, Clarice, you can count the hours. The hours go to, if you have a student who's interested in taking a Microsoft Office Specialist and you refer them, Metro East is currently hosting that, you refer them to Metro East, those hours from that student go back to your consortium. Again, this is a pilot. We're seeing how this works out. Um, if, if you have additional questions, please do feel free to contact me. Uh, moving on, uh, I just wanted to mention with Integrated English Literacy and Civics Education Grant, there is the deadline, end of the year reporting. It's due July 17th. If you want the final payment for your funds to go out, we need to have this report in by July 17th. And the next slide on integrated education and training, IET, there will be a new approval process beginning this year. It should be finalized by the end of July. The big changes are programs will submit the single set of learning objectives to Atlas first before they submit the form for approval. And then we're also asking that IETs must be approved before they begin. And like, as I said, we'll get a follow-up summary um, of that at the end of July. And with that, I think I'll turn it back to Brad. Yep, and while you're doing that, just note that uh, Caroline asked about where to find the uh, uh, IET approval form. So oh. but while you're answering that in the chat, I just want to say I look forward to seeing you all at Summer Institute this year. Uh, it's in person, the first uh, in-person Summer Institute since 2019. So I look forward to seeing you all then. Um, and uh, let's skip down to uh, the end then. And at this point, we can just, we acknowledge that it is um, about three o'clock here. So we can end the recording and answer any questions that you may have. <laughs>